Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in as always. <clears throat> if you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with the ministry, when we go live from our assembly building uh, on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly love to have you be a part of our uh, permanent YouTube audience. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church. We established this as an alternative to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites or would just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out here on Rumble as well. My featured book in this video is my book, The King James Bible in America, an Orthographic Historical and Textual Investigation. This, book's, this book covers things related to the printed history of the text in the United States, the copyright myth, and whether the King James Bible was ever copyrighted, as well as discussion of, of different pairs of words and how they um, would impact the printed history of the text. So if you're into this topic or would like to know more about the King James Bible, particularly in the United States, some history that isn't often covered, please consider picking up a copy of the King James Bible in America. There will be a link in the description to this video. So what I want to do in this video is I want to continue with um, rebroadcasting our Bible conferences from 2015. Some time ago, I realized that these conference messages were not on our YouTube channel. And so I've been migrating this information, uh, these, these messages onto this channel and recording just a brief introduction to each one of them. The message that you're going to see shortly is from um, Matt Hawley, Living the Heavenly Dream, Why the American Dream is a Lie. Um, very interesting topic here. Hopefully you'll find it encouraging and edifying. So very shortly, I'll be flipping it over to Matt. Before I do, I do want to remind you about one thing, a new podcast episode of the podcast I do with my wife, just the Just Grace It podcast with Brian and Becky Ross just dropped yesterday. And if you would like to pick that, check that out, please look at the link in the description for this video. So as always, we appreciate you tuning in. And without any further ado, I'm going to flip it over to Matt and you're going to hear him from 2015 discuss um, about why the American dream, living the heavenly dream, why the American dream is a lie. Thanks for attention and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning. Hope everybody's rested up. ready to go. I'd like to start this morning by reading you what I'm supposed to teach on. How's that? So the title that I was, I was given today is Living the Heavenly Dream, Why the American Dream is a Lie. And the sub points are we, we feel too at home here, set our affections above, this world is not our home, politics is not our hope, and security is not found in what we have. Shine as lights in the world. How can believers impact the culture? That's what we're going to try and go over today. So hopefully as, as, as we look at the verses that, the, that, that, that explain those things to us, we will be edified. And, and grow. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, again, we thank you for the time that we have together. I thank you for each and every person that's here today. I pray that as we study your word, that we'll be edified by it, and that it will fill us enough that we want to go out and share it with others. So in your name we pray. Amen. So if you think about that message, it's a pretty simple message, right? Not a lot there. I always find that exciting. Whenever I get the chance to bring what you call a simple message, it's exciting. You know why? Because the simple things are the things that make the biggest impact in your life. And they're also the easiest to forget. Think about when you first learned the gospel. The gospel is a very simple thing. Jesus Christ died, buried, and he was rose again. He was risen again on the third day. All we have to do is believe that. Salvation is by grace through faith, correct? And when we believe that, we're saved forever. It's simple. Things in life, the way, the way God's laid out the word, 
things in life are really that simple. We just got to pay attention and we got to keep reminding ourselves of them. Let's do one thing here. What I want to do is the world is not our home. I'm going to give you some verses that you already know and we're just going to stack some verses together and we're going to talk about the world. A lot of these verses we've already gone over this weekend, but when, when, when sometimes I shouldn't do this, but th this is my notes from yesterday, all right? The only reason I show you is because there's not a lot of notes there. There's a whole lot of verses written down there. And uh, if you would ask me six months ago, hey, how many verses are there on working and your daily work? I don't know, five, six, I can probably find. But when you distill it down and you look at what's really in the Word, we read the Word, but we read over so much and we don't pay attention to it. So when we can take the verses sometimes and stack them in a certain manner when we look at them, things become much more clear. And, and, and when we, we look at the world, it's no different. So go, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's just start there. We've already been there this weekend. Ephesians chapter 2. It says in verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So we know that there is a course to this world, and we talked about that course. It's something that's very difficult to resist, because every time you look around and you look out in the world, the world is designed to entice you into doing things that you're not supposed to do, correct? Do you know, do you, if, when you turn on the TV, do you, know, do you know what the entire purpose of TV is? It's, yeah, but even deeper than that. Okay, it's not entertainment. The entire purpose of a screen in front of your face is discontent, right? Because if I have to sell you something, what do I have to do first? I've got to make you want it, right? I've got to make you think that you need it. Best way to make you think you need it is that you're inadequate without it. That's how the course of this world works. It, it produces discontent in us, and we follow after the lust, and we follow after the flesh. Not only that, but we see that there's the prince of the power of the air. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it tells us that this world has a God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So we know the world has a course. It's, it, it, it's put in place by the prince of the power of the air. We looked at that on Friday night. And, and, and there's the God of this world. Now when you think about the God of this world, does that mean that Satan has power over this world? It's a, kind of a trick question. To some extent, but he's the God of this world because the world has made him the God of this world, right? It's who the, the world follows. They follow his course. And that's why he's the God of this world. So there's a course, there's a God. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 tells us that this world is what? Go ahead, you're probably there already. Somebody can speak it out. It's evil. That we live in a present evil world. <clears throat> I'm almost there. Apologize. Sometimes I'm slow. It's an opportunity for you to learn patience, right? <laughs> Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. If you think about what John said last night, we've been saved, he's going to deliver us from this present evil world. What that tells you is that while you're here, what is the world going to be? 
It's still evil. It's still evil. It's a playground for our flesh. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We've spent some time here as well. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but, that, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves, a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. When you look at this verse, it says, charge them that are rich in this world. The, the reason I bring it up, and I brought this up yesterday, is you and I are those that are rich in this world. In all of history, there's never been people as rich as us. I mean, there, there's been individuals who are rich, rich. But collectively, e e e even, the, even the poorest person in this room is rich by the world's standards, correct? What that tells you is as we're at home in this world, and, and because we're the rich in this world, Paul tells us in verse 17, he says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. So it tells us that there's some pitfalls in this world in the situation that you and I are in. And, and those pitfalls are that we can become high-minded which isn't a good thing. Why is it not a good thing to become high-minded? It's pride, right? Being high-minded means I take care of everything myself. I will, I will, I will, I will. Who's that sound like? That's high-minded. And then it says that not only that we, that we it doesn't want us to be high-minded, but that we not trust in uncertain riches. See, in this world, when you're in the situation that we are in, it's very easy to become high-minded and to trust in uncertain riches. And we live in a situation that is, is we, live, we live in a, in, in, in financially, not spiritually, but financially, we live in a wonderful country. And it presents these problems. And, the, and one of the things that it presents to us is it makes the world look better than it really is because we're way at the top. And when the world looks better than it really is because you're at the top, you end up wanting to play in it more and more and more, and you have the resources to do so. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Let's just get to the issue. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm sure you know exactly what we're going to get into here, but it says in Colossians chapter 3, Verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. And the reason for that is verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Go to Romans chapter 12. And this is very similar. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So there we're told not to be conformed to this world, that we're supposed to set our affections on things above. Do you know how you set your affections on things above, by the way? What does, what does the scriptures tell us about our affections? What we set our affections on, and by the way, setting your affections on things is a decision. You choose what you set your affections on. The world will teach you that you're just born a certain way and that you know, there's no change in you. And, and there might be some things that are like that. We all have certain personality traits and faults. But for the most part, when it comes to the things that we want and the things that we desire, we decide that. 
you know, it's, it's when you watch the TV and it makes you discontent, you decide that you want whatever it is that you want. So, once we're saved, once we realize that we're dead to this world, we need to set our affections elsewhere. And where we need to set our affections is on things that are above. Now, this is, this is something that I know we all hear all the time. But do you know why this is so difficult to do? Because you're in a world that you can see, right? You're in a world that everything I can touch, I can see. It, it seems so important right now to set my affections on the things that are around me because there's... there's, uh, <laughs> there's there, there, I, I read an old book once, and I'm, I'm not recommending that you read the book. But the book was on, on, on it was, it was on, I think it was called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And what it was about is how the urgent always steals away the important out of your life. And that most of us spend our time dealing with the urgent instead of dealing with the important. Yeah. And, and the reason we do that is because the urgent is right there in front of us and we can see it. But really, the important is above. It's invisible. We can't see it. And it's difficult for us to set our affections on that. But, but luckily, we've got this window that we can open up and we can look. And we can see. And what is that window? It's the Scriptures. We can look at the Word and we can read the Word and we can plug the Word into our life to the point that we can set our affections on things that are above. You see, when we spend time in the Word and we read what's important to God and we make those things important to us, that's the simple act of setting our affections on things that are above. And just like the course of this world works, and we talked about Eve, and we talked about when Satan set forth the course of this world, Eve took of the fruit because her, it made sense to her flesh, right? It was wrong, but it made sense to her flesh. And the course of this world works off the lust and the affections that are in our flesh, and it entices us, and we move towards those things. So if we can replace those affections with affections that are on above, guess what we're going to move towards? We're going to move towards those things. So this is a huge issue. You ever say, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel like my spiritual life's going anywhere. And you, and, and you start thinking about these things and you know, life feels stale. Well, you need to change your affections. You need to get them set on things that are above. Those things don't go stale. You just got to keep reminding yourself about them. And keep putting it in your mind and setting your affections on things above. Go to, go to 1 Timothy. And I want to I show you something in... in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 again. <clears throat> when we set our affections on things that are above, it sets us on a different course. It takes us out of the course of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want to show what it does for you. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9 says, But they that will be rich, and by the way, that's different than they that are rich. Right? What's the difference between they that will be rich and they that are, are rich? It, it's the desire, right? It's, it's this, this is what I'm going to set my affection on. This is what I'm going to chase. And it says in verse 9, But they that will be rich will fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. In this verse we've already looked at as well. And it says, And they, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's 2 Timothy 2.26. Both of those verses had a common word. What was it? Snare. How does a snare work? Well, there's, there's something that you want on the other side of a noose. Okay? There's something that you want on the other side of the noose. Nobody forces you in there. 
You walk into it because your desire, your affection is on the other side of a noose. And by the time you get to the desire or, or, or your affection, the way a noose works is you've got all those coils, right? And the snare works the same way. You've got all those coils, and as the rope tightens, it tightens himself around those coils, and before you know it, you're stuck in a snare. Satan works off of a snare. The, the scriptures tell you that. And the way he does it is he entices you. And, and the way you stay out of a snare, whether it's bad doctrine or whether it's your flesh or whatever it is, is you set your affections on things above. You hold to the truth and all of a sudden the snare doesn't matter. Why? Because what's on the other side? That's not what you're after any longer. You're not going to get tangled up in it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is one of my favorite verses, by the way. When you start to realize that most of the things that are offered to you in this world are not things that you should participate in or things that you should set your affections on or things that you chase, you have to ask yourself, what am I going to do now? Did I tell you to go to 1 Corinthians? I meant Seneca. I meant, okay, good. You guys went to the right place. I didn't. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. He says, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. Now, the next line, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world. Our conversation is how we interact with the world, correct? Paul tells us the testimony of his conscience was clear because of the fact that he operated in simplicity and in godly sincerity. In order to do that, in order, do you know how to, do you know how, how do you make something simple, by the way? How do you make something simple? Get rid of the Absolutely. You get rid of the stuff that you don't need, right? You take it and you take the time and you look at it and you figure out what, what, what's on here that I don't need? How can I simplify this and get it to do the exact same thing? You see, the world exact, works exactly opposite of that way because it tells you that you never have enough and that you always need more and that you're not complete. God tells you completely opposite. We're complete in Christ, right? We don't need anything else. We can operate in simplicity and godly sincerity because our needs have gone from this to virtually nothing. You think about what Paul's needs were. Food and raiment, right? He didn't always have that. You think about... <laughs> Have you, ever, have you ever thought about when you read Paul that, you know, if, if this guy walked on the earth, he'd be like a John the Baptist. If he walked on the earth today, people would just think he was crazy, right? Yeah. So, Paul, how was your day? It was fantastic. What happened? I got stoned. And not in the way that we think, not the way we would think of it in this modern society, right? <laughs> well, what else, what else happened? Well, I was in prison. I, I, I suffered shipwreck. And I, I did all these things. And you look at it, and, and you look at that long list, and you said, you just described a complete failure of a life. Because what this world tells you is important is not in your list. And what the world tells you to avoid is what your list is full of. What's your problem? His problem was his affections were on things above, not on things of this earth. And that's not a problem. And if it is, it's a problem you want. When we set our affections on things above, our needs completely change, our wants completely change, and how things affect us completely change. You remember yesterday I made the comment that God is more concerned about how the doctrine 
is exhibited and ador adorned and displayed in our circumstances than he is about the circumstances himself. And if that's the case, the worse your circumstances, the better the display, right? That's why Paul ends up glorying in those things. Because those things put the doctrine on display in such a wonderful manner. The, the, the troubles, the trials, the temptations that he went through. But, as John mentioned yesterday, and I'm supposed to talk about politics a little bit today, so forgive me. Um, I love to talk about politics, and not in the way you think I do. Okay? But... Uh, Politics are a way that you and I get wrapped up in this course of this world, and we expend so much stress and blood pressure and energy into things that we have no business expending energy into. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And grab Titus chapter 3 at the same time. First Timothy 2, verse 1 says this, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So the whole purpose when you read that is that we get to see what God's heart is. If we're going to set our affections on things above, we need to set our affections on the same thing that God sets His affections on, correct? Right? Makes sense. One of the things that God has His affections on is that, verse 4, we will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You set your affection on that, it changes how you look at things around you. All you have to do is back up to see how. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Don't be offended by my questions, okay? Sometimes the stuff I ask is tongue-in-cheek, and sometimes it might be a little more uh, aggressive than it needs to be. But when you read verse 1, and it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. When you turn on your conservative talk radio that teaches you how to think, does it make you want to do that verse? Not at all, does it? But you know, the world teaches you that we're going to bring into the kingdom. Christianity teaches you that we're going to bring in the kingdom, right? If you were going to do that, then it might make sense to listen to some of those things because of the fact that you would have a political issue and a political agenda that you need to promote. Imagine that you're a lobbyist. What does a lobbyist do? He what? Corrupts our politicians. <laughs> yeah, corrupts our politicians. <laughs> a lobbyist goes in and, 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 and he pushes a certain issue to those who can make the decision, right? Pretty simple concept. Um, it's not much different than an ambassador. What's the difference between an ambassador and a lobbyist? We're from a country. One comes from a foreign country and it pushes the, the, the things that are in the interest of that country. For the, they try and get their policies enacted in another country, right? And a lobbyist is from the same country, and he tries to get his policies enacted. You and I are ambassadors, right? And, and, and as ambassadors, what have we been given? The mystery of, or the <laughs> ministry of reconciliation. When you read these verses, if you had five minutes to sit down with your most hated political enemy, your goal should be to preach the gospel of grace. Period. Okay? Let me take that a little bit farther. If you've got a sticker on your car, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bad joke, but. <laughs> if you think about it, when we drive a car, right, you have two seconds to tell somebody the most important thing on your mind when you stick a sticker on it, right? What do you want people to know? Simple question. You can answer it. 
What do you want people to know? But what I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to get at today is we get so involved in politics because the Christianity teaches us that's the right thing to do. We've got protests we've got to, we've got to attend. We've got meetings we've got to attend. We've got people we've got to complain about. These are important, aren't they? We've got, we've, got, we've got opinions that we need to vehemently share every time somebody will give us an ear about how bad this person is and how bad that person is. Go to Titus chapter 3 for that one. It says, put them in mind, verse 1, to be subject to principalities, powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Verse 2, this one hurts. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Your concern about the politicians should be, are they saved or not? And not, not, not for whether it's your decision to vote for them or not, but you're, you're con you understand what I said there? That was probably confusing. I don't want to be concerned with their salvation. I do want, when I cast a... <laughs> I want to be concerned with their salvation. I want to be concerned that I'm going to preach to them the gospel. Not that I vote for them politically because they're saved or unsaved, although you might want to do that. But what I'm trying to get at is your priority with all men, rulers, kings, and those people, are that they hear the gospel. That's what you want them to do. But... Well, when we get caught up in politics, the last thing on our mind, if we bumped into Mr. Politician that I can't stand on the street, is the gospel because we're so angry, we're so worked up that they're destroying this and they're making a mockery of this. Welcome to the world, folks. We've already read about it. It's an evil place. We know that. Let's just move beyond it and let's get some ministry done and pray for these guys. And when we bump into them, preach the gospel to them. That's our calling. That's what we're supposed to do. That's my affection being set on things above. When you, when you listen to political propaganda from either side of the aisle, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says this. Just compare this with the latest political whatever you listen to. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Did it encourage you to think on those things? I doubt it because none of those things are really present in it, correct? But you and I, when we set our affections on things above, we've got to have something to think about. And what should we think about? Those things. Now, the next assignment I would give you when you were reading this verse would be, go out in the world and find those things. Find true things. <laughs> find honest things. Find just things. Find pure things. It's an impossible task. You're not going to be able to do it. Where are you going to find those things? You're going to find them in the Word. That's where you're going to find those things. Go to Philippians chapter, or you're in chapter 4. Keep reading there because I want you to see this. We know that godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. And we always think about contentment financially. Things. What I've got. Now, when you read Philippians chapter 4, what it says in verse 9, it says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, once again, the scripture tells you exactly where to find the truth. Where are you going to look for these things? When you, what you've received and heard and seen in me. And who's writing this? Paul. Do, and the God of peace shall be with you. I'd much rather have the God of peace with me than a politician on my side any day of the week. Verse 10 says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now, at, la at the last, your care of me hath flourished again. That's the care that uh, the service they were probably lacking in, in chapter 2. 
wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Now, verse 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatsoever state I am in, I, I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am struct, instructed to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. When he says whatsoever state I am in, that's whether he's in a good state, that's whether he's in a bad state, and I'm not talking about territorial states. I'm talking about whatever state of life, whatever his circumstances are throwing at him, whether it's a bad political leader, whether it's a good political leader. Did, you, did anybody follow any of the Blood Moon hype? I didn't. <laughs> I heard a lot about it because people are always asking questions. Um, but uh, anytime somebody comes up with that stuff, they say, you know, this is going to happen and this is going to happen on this date. And they start setting dates and they start preaching doom and gloom and terrible things to you. And my question to those is, okay, let's say you're right. You're 100% right. Ten days from now, everything's going to go bad. Financial collapse. We realize that uh, everything is just a giant conspiracy. Our money's all gone. All that stuff. Everything. Take your worst fear. It all happens tomorrow. What changed about your job? Nothing. So you can spend all your time looking at the world and building up what the world tells you to build up and trying to act the way the world tells you to act and it changes nothing about what your real job as an ambassador in Christ is. Amen. It's all the same thing. So what that tells you is every day when you get out of bed and you put your feet on the ground, you're an ambassador. And you're going to go out and you're going to do the same job. And you're going to set your affections on things above. And as you set your affections on things above, those are the things that you're going to pursue. And you're going to pray for the people that are around you, for your leaders and everybody else that you don't like. So that when you run into them, you're going to run into them with an attitude of, I want to give this guy the gospel. I, I, want, I want this guy to hear the word of God. I want to shine as a light. And we're going to get into lights in just a second. But whatever state he's in, he's going to be content. And you know how he can do it? He says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. See, in order to set your affections above, you have, to take, you have to be dead to the world, right? You have to take your own opinions, thoughts, reasoning, and you need to throw it out the door, and you need to replace it with the Word of God. And when we do that, we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I offer myself a living sacrifice. I want the life of Christ manifest in me in us, right? That's what we want. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're told to shine as lights in this world. Now, verse, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. Let's read the verses and then I'll comment some more. It says, For ye are sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. I love that verse. The reason I love that verse is because most of the time when you hear people talk about light and dark, they talk about it in the terms of team colors. What team are you on? Right? I'm on the light team. I'm on the dark team. And you get this very shallow look at how we do shine as lights in the world. And most people think they shine as lights in the world by influencing morality and all these different kinds of things. And, and, and while, while those things hopefully are a result of the gospel working 
in any kind of society. You go out and you want to change it. If you want to change a society, go out and preach the gospel. Yeah. That's the most basic thing you can do. And then what you do is as you preach the gospel, all men will be saved and they come to the knowledge of the truth, right? You want all men to be saved, they come to a knowledge of truth. As they come to the knowledge of the truth, the symptoms of the flesh start to fall away. But we, we attack the symptoms and we don't attack the problem. And, and when we think about light, most people think that when they're going to go out and shine their light, that they're going to go out and shine their light on the problems and the symptoms, and that's going to fix everything. But when you look at what this says, it says it gives us this definition of light, which is one of the, it, it's just phenomenal. You, it had to come from the Word of God because it, it's too simple to come from anything else. Other people would have made it much more complicated. It says, For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So what does light do? Okay. I'm in a dark room. I can't see what's going on. Somebody turns on the light. Everything is manifest. And I get to see it. That's what light does. And that's what you're supposed to do. Now, when you think about what we're supposed to light, we're supposed to light the things that people can't. See, and make them manifest. How do you make things manifest to people? Go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy... We faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we're going to make manifest. What are we going to make manifest? The truth. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So when we're going to take a light out into the world, we're going to make the truth manifest. When we decide to make the truth manifest, how are we going to do so? Political action? Lobbying? Preaching the gospel. Remember I told you this was a simple message, right? It's that simple, folks. When Paul says that he lived a life of simplicity and godly sincerity, it's that simple. We go out and we make manifest. We're lights. We shine. We do that by preaching the gospel. Because that's what gets light into people's hearts. And once that happens, see what happens. For we preach not ourselves... But Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Do you know why not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble are called? Why? Well, one, they're probably too distracted with things of the world. There are some of them that are called. But the other thing is, is that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Can I use an illustration out of Acts for you? Go to Acts chapter 4. I want to look at Peter for a minute. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. This is another great verse. This is, this is a verse that makes you smile. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, what did they do? They marveled. You know, a lot of us, when we decide that we're going to trust in the gospel, we believe, we learn about all these things, it scares us to, to, to go out and preach the gospel. It's a scary thing. Why is it scary to go out and preach the gospel? Because people are going to reject you, right? Those are just things you need to come to terms with. Um, I often say that when you decide you're going to go into the ministry, you need to go read Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and then spend some time wrestling with it to make sure it's true. What's Romans 1, 16 say? 
for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because you've got to wrestle that verse down before you get in the ministry, right? You, you've got to have that right. And then what happens is we, we, we look at ourselves and we say, if I go out and preach this, people are going to look at me funny because I'm a hypocrite. Well, guess what? The gospel was made for hypocrites. Right? If you could do it yourself, then you wouldn't need Jesus Christ and you can't do it yourself. And by the way, you're an earthen vessel. And it's not you. It's the power that's working in you and three, which is the gospel. It's the light. So if you're a little cracked, <laughs> I, take, I take comfort in that. It's okay. Because God designed it that way. Because what that does is that keeps you from being the one that ma is magnified and it makes the light, the truth, the issue. Now, Peter goes out and he preaches what he's preaching here in Acts chapter 3. He just got done healing a man and he preaches a message that nobody really likes. And uh, they look at him and they say, these are, after they perceive that he's an unlearned and an ignorant man. We, none of us want to hear that, right? <laughs> you wouldn't want somebody to say that about you. But what really, that's not really the issue. We're earthen vessels. Look what happens here. It says, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What astonished them about Peter and John? Their boldness, right? And when you looked at Peter and John and when you listened to them, it's pretty obvious that the world felt that they weren't the right guy for the job. Why? They're ignorant, unlearned men. But what happens is, it says they took knowledge of them that they had to, be, they had to have been with Jesus. Think about that for a minute. They're ignorant and unlearned guys. The only possible explanation we have for their boldness is what? They had been with Jesus. All right? That's the only possible explanation they could come up with. And, and, and while we're not in that exact situation right now, you can get the same truth over here when we look at Paul. We see that you and I are earthen vessels and we've got this light and we can shine that light and it's not about us. We may be ignorant, we may be unlearned, but it doesn't change the fact that God's power shines through all those things. Isn't that a great thing to think about? So what should that make us do? If we're going to be lights, and we're going to be people who go out and make manifest these things, I, I'm going to spend just a small portion on, on something that's, I think, very much part of the subject. And go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because we're talking about setting our affections on things above and not on things of this world. And I'm going to ask you a question here, and it's a trick question. How much time do you have? And when you ask that question, most people think about that from the standpoint of, I don't know. I could go at any minute. Well, that's fine, but you and I really have about the same amount of time. We've got right now, right? And we've got 24 hours in a day. It's been that way for all of humanity, okay? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says in verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. When Paul says that every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things, what's that a statement of? It's just, it is. It's knowing and understanding the truth. So if you're going to strive for the mastery, if you want to be the best at what you're going to do, you've got to be temperate in everything else. What does that mean? You don't spend a lot of time in it, right? If the question comes down to how much time do you have, and you've got 24 hours in a day, approximately a third of that's going to be taken up with sleep. You're supposed to set your affections on things above. We talked about work. That takes up a decent amount of time. That doesn't leave you with a huge amount of time in the day. But if you're going to strive for the master, you need to be temperate in all things. 
And, 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 and we're, we're supposed to be proving what is that acceptable, perfect, what? Will of God. In order us, for us to set our affections on things above, your time reflects your affections. Okay? What you choose to spend your time on is going to tell you where your priorities are. Now, we do have to spend time in carnal things, like I said, work, but can that be ministry? Absolutely. And am I supposed to do that, to provide for people? Yes, I am. So, as a believer who's going to set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth, what that means is that you're going to have a, a pretty big time shift. And, and what that means is if you're going to be, strive for the master, you're going to have to be temperate in all things. Remember, Paul lived a life of simplicity in godly sincerity. And what is simplicity? <clears throat> Taking out all the unnecessary, right? We're going to throw it away. We're going to get rid of it, and we're not going to spend any time on it. So we as believers, if we're going to set our affections on things above, we need to really evaluate what we're going to spend our time doing, and we need to look at the things that we don't and shouldn't and we're told not to spend time on, and we're going to throw it out, and we're going to spend things, time on the things that we're supposed to spend time on. I'm going to use a worldly illustration here. Warren Buffett talking about... Um, how to get things done, how to manage your time, came up with a great principle. And I think it reflects on this. The principle is this. You need to think about your life and you need to write down the 25 most important things in your life. So you write down the 25 most important things in your life. After that, you need to look and you need to think about that list for a while and you need to pick five things off that list that are the most important things. Now you've got two lists. You've got the five most important and you've got the 20 important. Now most of us would say that we spend our time on the five and we get, when we get the chance we spend the rest of our time on the 20. Warren Buffett says this, take that list of 20 things and realize those are things that you're supposed to avoid at all costs. And there's some wisdom behind that, and, and I think you can see the same thing in what Paul's saying. Not in the exact same way. I'm not trying to interject. I'm just giving you an illustration. But here's the point. There's plenty of noble causes that you can spend your time with. There's plenty of good things that you can do with your life. But, until you pick exactly what you're supposed to be doing, you really don't have any a direction. And when you pick what you're absolutely prioritized and what you are supposed to be doing, the good things that aren't on that list become the most possible greatest distraction in your life. Right? Because what they're going to do is they're things that you find acceptable to spend your time on that completely pull you away from the priority. If we're going to strive for the mastery, what do we need to be? Temperate in all things. I'm not giving you a list of things to eliminate in your life. That's up to you. But when you set your affections on things above, the list gets really small, really quick. Yeah. And I am going to tell you what you should spend some time on. And that's making things manifest. That's going out, preaching the gospel, sharing it with the people around you. And the final thing I want, I, I want to get to is Paul tells Timothy, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because you hear this and, and, and you say... How, how, do I, how do I set my affections on things above? How, how do I do this? How, how do I create this passion in me? What, do I, what am I supposed to do? Well, we know that we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. Is that, is that an adequate way to spend our time? Not, not just adequate, but is, are we supposed to be doing that? Yeah. But when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul says to Timothy, he says, Til, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Okay? He tells him, till I come, give attendance to these things. 
reading, exhortation, and doctrine. If you don't do this yet, one of the best ways to set your affections on things above, and it, it's impossible to shine as a light without this, is you've got to spend time reading. And the same principle applies. <laughs> Figure out what's the most important thing to read, and the things that come in second are probably the things you should stay away from. But what's the most important thing we need to spend time reading? The Word. Because what happens is we take the Word and we start plugging it into ourselves. And we plug it in, and we plug it in, and you say, well, I still don't really have this desire to go out and share the Gospel. I don't have this desire to, to be the light in the world that I'm supposed to be. I don't have the desire, okay, keep putting more in, and keep putting more in, and, and spend more time doing it, and spend more time thinking about it, and pray about it. Pray about what's going in. And think about it and digest it. And eventually what will happen is it's just like anything else in life. You cram it full enough and things start coming out. It just doesn't fit anymore. It's got to go somewhere. So if you're going to be the light and you're going to go out and you're going to take the gospel to people, just keep shoving the word into your head. Just keep shoving the word in your head because inevitably you're going to end up talking about it even when you don't think you should. Let me give you an example. Oh, how was your day today? And the first thing, the mo usually the most annoying thing that people will tell you about, right? Oh, well, it's, people will tell you fine, but if you get a little bit further into com conversation, they're going to tell you what's been on their mind all day long. Had a flat tire on the way to work today. It was terrible. It was this, it was that, it was this. Because that's what their mind's been on. Give attendance to reading which means you're going to have to put time into it. If you're going to have to put time into it, there's limited time. You're going to have to take something and you're going to have to throw it out because it may look good, but it's not important. It's probably just urgent. It's probably just something that you're going to play with and it's going to distract you from doing these other things. Go to Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to finish with this. In Philippians chapter 3, it says in verse 15, Let us therefore, as many be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, in anything, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So he tells them he wants them to be this minded. By the way, we have the ability to be earthly minded, right? We don't have to try very hard to be earthly minded. Paul's telling us something opposite of minding things on the earth. And he says, as many as be perfect. Does that mean sinless? No. No. It's talking about being mature. Now, if you look and you go back to verse 3, and we're not going to read through all this. Paul start, or you go back to verse 1 in chapter 3. Paul says, finally, my brethren. And when he says, finally... He's going to summarize some things. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Tells him to beware of some things. And then he goes and he says in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus my Lord. When he says I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, he's showing you that he's made his life a living sacrifice, that he set his affections on things above, and all the things that have fallen away because of that, what's he count them as? Dung. Why? That I may win Christ. You see, he's, he's talking about running away race and, 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 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And here he talks about he wants to win Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he's going to be temperate in all things because he's going to strive for the mastery. And then here you learn that the goal is it's that I may win Christ. And he's not talking about a hope that it will happen. But what, he, what he's talking about, that's what he's striving for. That's the goal. That's where he's going. That's where his affection is. And his life is showing that because it's ordered in a manner to do that in simplicity and godly sincerity. Verse 9 says, And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, 
Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of the res his resurrection. When he talks about he wants to know the power of his resurrection, he's not just talking about the adoption and the rapture there. He's talking about the walking in newness of life. Knowing the power of his resurrection right now. And he says in verse 13, But brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to end with a warning. Verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us. For an example, verse 18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now look at what their problem is. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind what? This earth is not your home. Don't mind earthly things. You see the description of these people there. Paul says this in verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. You know, try and pull every conversation that you have to heaven. <laughs> I know that's not specifically about conversations. But a little play on words there, right? It, 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 it's a good way to shine the light. From whence we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Folks, this is not our home. We're not supposed to be wrapped up in getting more stuff. We're not supposed to be wrapped up in the politics of this world. We're supposed to be praying for those people. We're supposed to have the gospel on our tongues so that we can make manifest what God wants to make manifest in this world. The quicker we realize that, the better things get, because there's just so much less in life to worry about when your affections are set on things that are above. And we can have the peace of God operate in us, because godliness with contentment. We can learn to whatsoever state we're in to be content, because this isn't our home. No matter what you do to me, no matter what you take away from me, no matter where you put me, you don't change who I am in Christ. You can't take that away from me. Not only that, but you can't change my job. We're supposed to be lights. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what a great privilege we have to be earthen vessels carrying your power to this world. I pray that we will do so and that we won't be ensnared in the traps that are out there. It's your name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks, Matt. We're going to take a 15-minute break. The cue that we're starting is when you hear the music.